Welcome to J4's English Training. I'm Jennifer, and today you're going to learn English through stories. We're going to review four different news articles, and through this review, you're going to learn a lot of advanced vocabulary, advanced grammar, and even correct pronunciation. Let's get started. As you can see, we're talking about the new movie Avatar: The Way of Water. So this is the title of the movie: Avatar: The Way of Water. Now let me read the full headline: Avatar: The Way of Water passes one billion dollars at the global box office. That's a lot of money, right? This is the short form for billion. So let me write that out for you. Billion. Now, have you seen the original Avatar movie? I have not seen the original, and to be honest, I probably won't see this one either because I don't really like sci-fi movies too much. What about you? Let me know in the comments if you've seen the original, if you've seen this one, or you're excited to see this new movie. All right, let's continue on with our article. Avatar: The Way of Water has made one billion dollars at the global box office in just fourteen days, becoming the fastest film to pass the milestone this year. Let's look at this here: the milestone. This is a noun, and this is noun. This is an important event, and it can be in business or in life in general. So, what could be a milestone for you? An important event in your life. The first one I think of is probably graduating, graduating from school, graduating from university, getting married, having a baby. Those important events in one's life. So, you could say. Graduating was an important milestone for me. So notice here, I'm starting my sentence with what? What is this grammatically? I'm starting my sentence with a gerund, a gerund, and this acts as the subject of my sentence. And we do this when we're making a general statement. Graduating was an important milestone for me. Now you could use it in business as well. We might say, "Let's set a milestone to double our profits this year." So in this case, it's similar to a goal, and the verb that we use with goal is you set. A goal. That's just simply when you make a goal, but we don't say make a goal. We say set a goal, and you can set a milestone as well. So pay attention to that verb choice. And this is the same thing as saying a goal. And notice when you reach a goal, you can also pass a milestone, which is another way of saying exceed. So they did more than one. Billion dollars. They passed it. So the milestone for the film was one billion dollars, and they passed it. They went beyond it. All right. So obviously a very successful film. Let's continue on. The long delayed sequel has proved a hit with audiences despite wildly varying reviews. So a sequel is when there's the original movie. I don't know if you remember, but there was an original Avatar movie many years ago, and a sequel is when they create another movie. So it's part one is the original, and then part two is the sequel. And in the sequel, they continue the story. So you can think of it as. <laughs> Easily, I'll just say part two, or it could be two or more. They can have more than one sequel, and that is a continuation, continuation of the original movie. It could be a TV 
a TV show as well. Now notice here, has proved, has proved. Prove is one of those verbs that actually has two separate forms that are acceptable in the third form, the participle. You could also say proven, has proven, and both of them are correct. So our verb conjugations are to prove, that's the infinitive, and then you have prove as the base, of course, and then we have proved, and then you can have proved or proven. Now, although both of these are correct, I would probably say that proved is more common but I do hear proven enough that it's worth you knowing that both of them are acceptable and grammatically correct. But if you want to keep it easy, since proved is the past simple, you can also just remember proved as the participle as well. Okay, so here, to be a hit has proven a hit. A hit in this case is something that is very popular or successful. So this is a really great idiom. So you might say our party was a hit. Our party was a hit. This means your party was very successful. It was popular. People enjoyed it. So ultimately it was successful. Our party was a hit. You could say, I hope our launch will be a hit. So notice this is in the future because I'm using I hope. I hope our launch will be a hit. So I don't know yet. Launch is when you introduce something new into the market. For example, a new product or service, you launch it. So you introduce it for the first time. So here, our expression is, this is a verb to be expression, to be a hit. Now, you need to conjugate your verb to be according to the subject and the time reference, of course, like always. So let's say you had more than one party or parties. Maybe you had an anniversary party, a birthday party, and a retirement party all in the same month. You could say our parties were, because we have the past simple with they, the subject is they, they were a hit. Our parties were a hit. Now notice I don't say our parties were hits, although a hit technically is singular, but I change my verb to be, I don't change my noun here. Our parties were a hit. I don't change it to hits, okay? So you conjugate your verb to be. To be a hit, and let me just write out the meaning, to be successful or popular. So it makes sense they're saying the movie was a hit. It was successful. Well, why was it successful? Because it was popular. So they're saying the same thing, really, successful or popular. Let's continue on. It is one of only three films to surpass $1 billion this year after Top Gun Maverick and Jurassic World Domination. So this is another example of a sequel because there was an original Top Gun movie from, I don't know, the 80s, the 1980s or 1990s. I'm not sure. Long, long time ago with Tom Cruise. And then this year they made a sequel, a sequel. So Top Gun Maverick is a sequel. So Top Gun Maverick, this movie is a sequel. The original was made in, I'm just going to say the 1980s. I'm not sure if that's correct. It might be the 90s. The original was made in the 1980s. Now notice I added the because I have 
80s in general, when you have a year in general, 80s, a decade, 80s, 90s, you have to say the 80s, the 90s. But if I said in 1981 and I was specific or 84, 87, then you don't use an article the was made in 1987 or was made in the 80s. You can just put 80s or you can add 1980s. If anyone knows when the original was made, then you can share that in the comments. Have you seen the original Top Gun? Have you seen the sequel Top Gun Maverick? I have seen neither, <laughs> but you can share in the comments. I have seen Jurassic World Domination. Okay, no, let's take a look at this. It is one of three. Now notice here, films. One of three films. Now the films is plural because it represents the three films. So there are three films. Now one of those three films. So that's why films is plural, even though we have one. So you might say it was one of my favorite movies, movies with an S. When you have one of, it means there are more than one movies, but your talking about one specific, but the noun is plural. Okay. But notice my verb is conjugated as singular. It was because of the one. So that's why the subject and the verb is singular, but the noun is plural. So I might say she one of our best employee. Okay, so do I want employee or employees? And do I want she is or she are? <laughs> well, hopefully this is pretty obvious to you that we need she is one of our best employees. And then I need plural because in the company as a whole, there are many employees. So that can be a tricky sentence structure, but obviously a very common sentence structure as well. So get comfortable with forming sentences like that because you will use them a lot. Okay. So notice here, they changed it to surpass instead of pass. In this case, they're exactly the same. You can pass something, you can surpass something. I would say we generally use surpass when you're talking about money specifically, like a specific dollar amount. And then you can use pass because remember before they were talking about milestones. So you pass a milestone, but you surpass a specific dollar amount. And both of them just means you went beyond, you exceeded. Okay, let's continue on. However, director James Cameron has said his technologically innovative movie needs to make $2 billion to break even. Wow. If you know what this means, you know why I said wow. To break even. This is when your total cost is the same as your total profit. So expenditures or costs and your profit are exactly the same. So what you put out and what you get back are even. Even means the same. So basically he's saying the movie costs $2 billion to produce, to create. So they need to earn $2 billion just to break even. 
not to get any profit. Profit is additional money after your expenses. So if the movie makes $3 billion, $2 billion is the cost of the movie, and then $1 billion will be profit. So you this is generally used in a business context, break even, but you can use this in your situation as well, like more everyday situations. Let's say you bought a house. Okay, so house price, I'll just say, yeah, price you paid, let's say 500,000, okay? This was the cost of your house, 500,000. And then house sold, 500,000. At this case, you broke even. You didn't gain any money and you didn't lose any money. You broke even. So you might say, we broke even on the sale of our house. We broke even. Now, I took my verb break and I put it in the past simple. Again, you might say, Let's say you bought a house during the pandemic when prices were really high, at least in North America, and you need to sell your house today when prices are low. That's not a good situation for you, right? So you might say, I hope we at least break even, which means I hope we at least get the exact amount of money we spent on the house. Now, any more money, then you would say we made, we made. So in this case, if you sold your house for, I'm going to put it up here, house sold, let's say 600,000, then you could say we made, we made 100,000, K is the short form for thousand, and we verbalize it, 100K, 100K, we made 100K, 100,000 on the sale of our house. All right, now I'll just cover all the bases <laughs> because if the house sold for let's say 400,000, this is not a good situation for you at all, 400,000, 400K, then you have to say, unfortunately, we lost 100,000 on the sale of our house, which is very unfortunate. So hopefully you're in this situation and at the very least in <laughs> this situation. Let's continue on. The film picks up after the events of 2009's Avatar. This is the, oh, the original Avatar. Oh no, I asked when Top Gun was made. Original Avatar was made in 2009. Okay, so this is the original. Now, in 2022, they're talking about the sequel. The film picks up after the events of 2009's Avatar, which is the highest grossing film of all time. That's awesome. With box office receipts of $2.97 billion. Hmm. And remember, this is in 2009, so the value of that money was more in 2009. All right, highest grossing, gross. This simply is another way of saying highest earning, highest earning. In more of a business talk uh, context, they use the term gross, gross profit, gross margin, margins, gross sales. So that's just more of a business term. But in more of an everyday context, you can use highest earning film of all time. Okay, let's look at this. Pick up because, of course, you know the phrasal verb to pick up. I just picked up a pen 
Or you can pick your kids up from school, which means to get your kids at school. But let's look at this because they're not talking about picking something up and they're not talking about bringing someone from one location to another. So what are they talking about in this context? Well, remember, they're talking about the sequel, which was filmed in 2022. It picks up after the events of 2009. In this context, it means it continues. It continues where the film left off. So in this case, pick up, you can think of it as to continue where it left off. Now, this is a useful phrasal verb because we use it quite commonly in conversations. Let's say you're in a meeting and you're discussing your sales strategy for an upcoming product launch, okay? But you have another meeting you have to go to. So you end your current meeting, but you're not done talking. There's still more to discuss. You can say, let's pick this up tomorrow. Let's pick this up tomorrow. Let's pick this up tomorrow. So this is our conversation. Let's pick our conversation up tomorrow. So in this context, you can understand it means let's continue talking about the sales strategy. I don't remember what I said. <laughs> let's continue talking about our sales strategy. And we stopped talking about this one point. So tomorrow, when we continue our conversation, we're going to start talking about the last topic of this meeting. So let's pick up our conversation tomorrow. So in this specific context, it means continue. It's very useful when you're having any sort of conversations or discussions. It doesn't have to be a business context. You could be discussing your vacation plans with your wife, your husband, your friend, and then you have to make dinner or you have to pick your kid up from school. Notice in that context, pick up is a totally different phrasal verb. So you might say, Let's pick this up tomorrow, uh, pick this up after dinner and finalize our flights. So maybe you were discussing your flights. You have to go make dinner after dinner. You're going to pick up the conversation and finalize your flights, which is what you were talking about. All right, let's continue on. Analysts say the new installment is unlikely to beat that figure as cinema attendances are still down post pandemic. Okay. The new installment, this simply means the sequel, the sequel is, it's not the most common way of saying it. I would just ignore this. I don't think it's that useful. Analysts say the sequel. That's the easiest way of saying it. Analysts say the sequel is unlikely. So in this case, maybe we'll say less than 50% chance. So maybe a 40% chance, a 30% chance. It's unlikely to beat that figure. So the figure in this context, if they don't define a noun, you have to look back at the last referenced figure, the last reference number. And in this case, it's 2.97 billion. So that is the figure, 2.97 billion. Remember, BN is the short form of billion. You could even just do billion with a B but I'll just put BN. So that's the figure, $2.97 billion. So beat in this case means exceed. So to make 3 billion, 3.5 billion, 4 billion, that would all be exceed or beat to do more. So it's unlikely. There's less than a 50% chance. 
And at this time, it's made 1 million, right? That's the, no, sorry, 1 billion. That's the milestone it passed, $1 billion. So it has 2 billion more that it needs to make, earn, before it beats its original movie. So before the sequel beats the original movie. But remember, it needs to make $2 billion to break even, to be at that point. All right, let's continue on. But based on current performance, the film is likely to overtake Top Gun Maverick as the biggest film of 2022. Overtake means, again, this is another way of saying exceed. So Top Gun was in the lead. It was performing very well. But then Avatar, right now, maybe Avatar is even. But oh, Avatar just overtook Top Gun. It is now in the lead. So to become the leader, to overtake, to become the new leader. Top Gun was the, was the leader. Avatar overtook. Notice I just conjugated when I said that out loud, overtook, because our verb is take. You need to conjugate take. So in this case, in the past, it is overtook. So we can say Avatar overtook Top Gun as the biggest film of 2022. If this has in fact happened. In this case, it hasn't happened because they're saying it's likely. Likely means there is more than 50% chance. That's likely more than 50% chance. Let's continue on. That news may come as a surprise to critics, some of whom panned The Way of Water as a lumbering, humorless, damp squib of a movie in which nothing meaningful happens and the story is really pretty stupid. So some negative adjectives you can add to your vocabulary if you choose <laughs> to come as a surprise. This is simply a way of saying the news may seem unexpected. So critics, critics are the people that do not like the movie. Okay, those are the critics. They don't like the movie. So for them, it would be unexpected that Avatar is the most, most popular movie of 2022. It came as a surprise. So this is a great expression. Our verb is come. So you need to conjugate it based on your verb tense. So you might say, I was promoted and it came as a surprise, which means you were not expecting the promotion. You were not expecting the promotion. Now, we also use this in the negative form to say you were expecting it. Because if I say, and it didn't, come because here this is my past simple right came but if i'm adding my negative the negative is didn't in the past simple and now i need my base verb come i was promoted and it didn't come as a surprise which means you were expecting the promotion so we use both you can say it came as a surprise it didn't come as a surprise both are very common Let's continue on. Water. Oh, sorry. That's the way of water. And we read that part, all those negative adjectives. Okay, others. So others, if we were talking about the critics, the other people would be the ones that enjoyed the film. So I guess we could call them the fans. The fans. That would be the opposite. You have critics and then you have fans. 
So fans, opposite of critics. So fans like the film, critics don't like the film. I have critics as well. And I also have fans. I hope you're one of my fans and not one of my critics. Okay. Others, the fans, were more enthusiastic, calling the film an eye-popping, jaw-dropping spectacle and a fully immersive waking dream. So I just kind of acted it out because imagine you, you're watching this movie and your eyes open wide. Generally, that happens when we're very engaged or we're surprised in a good way. When something is really beautiful, your eyes open wide. So that's where this comes from, an eye popping or jaw dropping. So you might say, seeing the Eiffel Tower for the first time was jaw dropping. Or you could say, was I popping? So when I saw it, I went in awe and beauty. So awe and beauty. What about you? Have you had a jaw dropping experience, an eye popping experience, a place you saw, something you saw that was just so beautiful, unique, interesting? Share it in the comments if you have. Practice your new vocabulary. All right, let's move on. The original Avatar was essentially a science fiction version of Pocahontas following the story of greedy colonialist humans stripping the resources of a distant planet called Pandora. Greedy, you probably know what this means, but... It's very common, so I'll just share it just in case. This is an adjective, and it describes somebody who is not generous. It's the opposite of generous. For example, my sister got a huge box of chocolates (laughs) for her birthday, but she wouldn't share with anyone. She's so greedy. (laughs) So it can be when somebody doesn't want to share their possessions, their money, their food. We use this commonly with food. I know probably you instantly think about money, but we use it a lot with food as well. So if somebody doesn't want to share their food with you, you can say, Stop being so greedy. Stop being so greedy. So notice, stop, and now I have my gerund. Stop is a gerund verb. Our verb is the verb to be. She is, this is the contraction form. She is, she's, she is so greedy. So my verb is the verb to be. In the gerund form, I need being. Stop being so greedy. That could be something someone says to you if you don't want to share. Hopefully you're not greedy. The sequel is set several years later as Sully and Nightiri I don't know how to say this name because I did not see the original Avatar, and this is not an English name, so I will just say Nightiri. Sully and Nightiri head underwater to protect their planet from another human invasion while attempting to raise a family. Okay, uh, let's just look at this head. This is a pretty common verb, so this is a verb. Now, to head. This is used as a way of saying to go, to go. So head underwater, so they live on the surface, on the ground, now they're going underwater, they're heading underwater. We use this a lot when talking about going to a specific location. So for example, what time do you want to head to the mall? What time do you want to head to the mall? This simply means go. Or 
let's say you were at your friend's party and another friend could ask you, what time did you head home? What time did you go home? What time did you leave the party? But go home is another way of saying leave. So the verb doesn't replace leave. The verb replaces go, but we use it in a very specific context, not go in any context. We use it very to go to a specific location. That's how I would use it. Even in a business context, very common. What time are you heading to the conference, for example? So you can add this to your vocabulary to sound very natural, but also you'll probably hear it a lot from native speakers and now you know what it means. So that's the end of our article. Are you excited to watch the sequel of Avatar or maybe even the original if you haven't seen the sequel yet? Now what I'll do is I will read the article in full from start to finish so you can practice along with my pronunciation. So let's do that now. Avatar, the way of water, passes $1 billion at the global box office. Avatar, the way of water, has made $1 billion at the global box office in just 14 days, becoming the fastest film to pass the milestone this year. The long-delayed sequel has proved a hit with audiences despite widely varying reviews. It is one of only three films to surpass $1 billion this year after Top Gun Maverick and Jurassic World Domination. However, director James Cameron has said his technologically innovative movie needs to make $2 billion to break even. The film picks up after the events of 2009's Avatar, which is the highest grossing film of all time, with box office receipts of $2.97 billion. Analysts say the new installment is unlikely to beat that figure, as cinema attendances are still down post-pandemic. But based on current performance, the film is likely to overtake Top Gun Maverick as the biggest film of 2022. That news may come as a surprise to critics, some of whom panned The Way of Water as a lumbering, humorless, damp squib of a movie in which nothing meaningful happens and the story is really pretty stupid. Others were more enthusiastic, calling the film an eye-opening, jaw-dropping spectacle and a fully immersive waking dream. The original Avatar was essentially a science fiction version of Pocahontas, following the story of greedy colonialist humans stripping the resources of a distant planet called Pandora. The sequel is set several years later as Sully and Naitiri head underwater to protect their planet from another human invasion while attempting to raise a family. Amazing job with that article. Now feel free to hit pause, take a break, go get a cup of coffee or tea, review the vocabulary you just learned, and when you're ready, hit play and we'll continue on with the next article. I'm sure you recognize Prince Harry and you may know that he just released a memoir called Spare. That's what we're talking about today and I'm sure that's what many people around the world are talking about right now. So let's read the headline. Prince Harry's memoir, Spare, which captures the ugly side of royal life, hits bookshelves. Now let's talk about the title of this memoir. A memoir is simply a book that talks about your own experience or memories, a memoir. Now spare in English is an adjective. It's an adjective and it means extra or additional. That's not 
in use. So not in use. So that means that's available. That's not in use. That's available. For example, I could say, do you have an umbrella? Now, if I wanted to be more specific, I could say, do you have a spare umbrella? Remember, as an adjective, it comes before the noun and it just lets you know that I don't want your umbrella if you're using it. I want an additional umbrella that you're not using. So you might say, do you... Do you have a spare pen? <laughs> if you're in a class and you're taking notes or you want to take notes and you don't have a pen, you could turn to someone and say, do you have a spare pen? So I would guess that spare in this context is referring to the fact that he is like the extra member of the royal family, not in use because there's no way he's ever going to become king because his older brother, William, is going to be king. So he's like the spare. That's what I would guess. I don't know if that's true or not. Now let's talk about this. Hits bookshelves. Hits bookshelves. So hit is our verb, to hit. It's being used in a different way, of course, because hit is this. That's the verb to hit. But to hit a bookshelf, when a product hits a location, it simply means to become available, to become available. So I'll write that out because it's used in the context of when a product hits a location, it becomes available. So you might ask, let's say, a new iPhone was released or is going to be released, you might ask, when does the new iPhone hit the store, hit the shelves, hit the internet? Because you can buy it online, right? Movies, when does that new movie hit the theaters, become available in the theaters? So it's very commonly used. So when does his or his new memoir became available? Hit the bookshelves. All right, let's continue on. Prince Harry's memoir was released Tuesday. This is when it hit bookshelves, Tuesday. Not only offering. Right now, when I see this, not only I know that later on in the sentence, they're going to say, but also not only, but also because those two go together. So let's find out where they say that not only offering new details on the British Royal family's bitter internal feud after days of bombshell revelations and promotional interviews. Whoa, that was quite long actually, ah, but also describing. So we use this expression, not only, but also when we want to talk about two different benefits or features or points about one thing. So you might say the book not only talks about the royal family, but also talks about his relationship with Meghan Markle, his wife, for example, not only, not only, and then you have your clause, but also, and then you have your second clause, your second point. So that's a very advanced structure. It's a nice structure. So you can practice using that in your own. We use this a lot in written English, but you can absolutely use it in spoken English as well. So we have not only but also let's also look at this bitter, 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 bitter is an adjective. When someone is bitter, they're angry or upset about something that they just can't forget about. So let's say 
last week or two weeks ago, a friend didn't invite you to their party. So you're angry and upset. You were angry and upset at the time, but two weeks later, you're still angry and upset. So the anger and the feelings of being upset have lasted because of that event. That's when you would say, she's bitter. She's been angry and upset for a long (laughs) time. Angry and upset about a past event, I'll say. And you're still angry and upset now. So the family's bitter feud. A feud is a fight. It's another way of saying fight. Their feud. I do hear this quite a lot in the media to describe when two people are fighting. It could be a family. It could be within a company. It could be friends, celebrities. I often hear them describe it as a feud in the media. But honestly, in in my own speech, in speech with my friends, movies, I don't hear that a lot. It's I hear it more specifically in the media. In everyday context, we just say fight. The family's bitter internal fight. After days of bombshell revelations. Now, a bombshell is a announcement that has a really big impact. Because a bomb, imagine a bomb. Right? So imagine you deliver news to someone and there's a big impact of that. In this case, a revelation is information that wasn't available, secret information, and now it is available. And by describing it as a bombshell, it had a big impact. So that's a bombshell revelation. Just information being shared that has a very big impact. Let's continue on. But also describing how he fell headlong in love with his future wife, Meghan Markle. So this was quite a long paragraph. And then I summarized it in this very short paragraph. The media does that. They like to use additional adjectives to make it sound really important or entertaining when you can say the same thing in a more simple way. Okay, let's continue on. While many of the details from the book, titled Spare, have already been reported, its release at midnight Monday local time will allow the public to get their hands on a copy of a memoir filled with glimpses into a rarefied family riven by disagreement and distrust. When you get your hands on something. So notice the sentence structure. Our verb is the verb get one's hands. The one in this case is the subject they. So it's there as the possessive pronoun to get one's hands, plural hands on is our preposition and then something. When you get your hands on something, it just means that you have it. And we usually use this when the something might be difficult to to obtain or there's some sort of significance in obtaining. Let's say there were only 10 iPhones that hit the shelves and I was able to get my hands on one. I was able to obtain one and that is special or significant because there aren't many available. So here's the example sentence and remember, get one's hand. So you need to match the possessive pronoun to the subject. So I put that here for you as well. So you remember one's hands. Let's continue on. Okay, with glimpses into, glimpses into. When you glimpse at something, you look at something quickly 
and you don't necessarily see the whole thing. You just see a part of it. So let's say I'm driving. I might glimpse at a billboard. A billboard is just a poster that you see on a highway. So I'm driving and I glimpse at it. I can't stare at it or look at it for a long time because I'm driving. I have to pay attention to the road. So I might glimpse at it quickly. So to look at something quickly. So that, let me write that for you. So to glimpse, to glimpse at something is to look at something quickly. So in this context, if we get a glimpse into the royal family, it means we get to look at the royal family, but only briefly because we only get to see what the memoir shares with us, right? So that's what it's trying to let us know. We get to look at the royal family, but only a little bit. Rarified is an adjective and as an adjective, it means not ordinary. So of course the royal family is not ordinary. They're extraordinary. They're rarefied. So we use this as an adjective to describe the family. They're rarefied, the rarefied family. So if there is a company that is quite different from ordinary companies, you might say it's a rarefied company. For example, I don't think you'll use this adjective too much in your vocabulary, but just to understand the article, a rarefied family riven by disagreement, riven by is another way of saying divided by, because you have your family as a whole, the family is not arguing they're together, but if the family is divided riven by, it means the disagreement caused the family to separate, to become divided, riven by. So this is another way of saying divided by, divided by disagreement. Let's continue on. Some Britons flocked to bookshops overnight to be among the first to buy a copy of Spare. When you flock to a location, it describes when a large number of people go to a location, generally at or around the same time. So you might say that people flocked to the Apple store when the new iPhone hit the shelves. When the new iPhone hit the shelves, they flocked to. So a large number of people and they generally went around the same time because the iPhone was released at a specific date and time. And that's when everybody went. So to flock to a large number of people. Let's continue on. Some of the book's most eye-catching passages include allegations that Harry's brother and heir to the throne, Prince William, physically attacked him during a dispute, that his stepmother, Camilla, the queen consort, leaked private conversations to bolster her reputation, and that his father, King Charles III, had pleaded with his sons to not make his final years a misery with their arguing. So remember, we learned another word, another word for fighting. We could say with their arguing, with their fighting, with their feuding. That could be another word, with their feuding. So I'll leave that there. When something is eye-catching, it means that your eye is drawn to it. So your eye naturally goes to it. It is more interesting or it stands out more. It gets your attention. That's eye catching. So the passages, passage is just right now we're reading a passage of this article. So it's a piece of the article article and eye catching is most interesting parts, passages, most 
interesting. Now it could be another adjective, interesting, engaging, most entertaining, for example, but I'll just say most interesting. An allegation is when someone accuses someone else. You did this. That's my allegation against you. So Harry had allegations against his brother, William. You did this. That's what he said in the book. So he physically attacked him. So physical means that there was violence involved. He touched him. He maybe hit him. We don't know, but there's some sort of physicalness. Attacked him during a dispute. Dispute is another word for fight. During a fight or an argument or again, a feud, (laughs) we could say. Camilla leaked. When you leak something, it's when you make it available, but it should not be available. So these private conversations, they're private for a reason. But if you leak them, it's when I say, oh, here's the conversation and I give it to you, but you shouldn't have it. So that is the verb to leak. This is a verb. I know it's a verb because it's conjugated in the past simple. So to make information available when it shouldn't be because it's private information. It's not supposed to be public. To bolster her reputation. Bolster in this sense is another way of saying to improve, to increase, to bolster her reputation to improve, improve or increase. But in this case, it's improved because you don't necessarily increase a reputation, but you can improve it. A lot of people don't like Camilla, right? She has a negative reputation. She wants to improve it, to bolster it. Now, I think to plead with someone is please don't, please don't. That's to plead with someone. To plead with his sons not to make his final years a misery. A misery would be terrible. A misery with their arguing, feuding, disputing, or fighting. Let's continue on. The publication of such a frank and revealing account is a near unprecedented event in the centuries old history of Britain's royals, who, as Harry has pointed out, double as both a family and national institution. The book has led to questions over whether it could deal lasting damage to the monarchy, even asking whether its future existence is now less certain. Okay, a frank and revealing account. Frank is another way of saying honest and honest and revealing. I'll just write this first. Honest revealing is when you share a lot of details. So that comes from the verb to reveal, which means to share with details. So to reveal, to reveal a lot of details or information to share. Share a lot of details or information. And then Frank means honest. An unprecedented event is an event that doesn't happen very often. It's never happened. It's unprecedented. Now, unprecedented on its own means that it's never happened before. But when you say near unprecedented, it means that it's almost. So near means almost in this sense. So it's implying that it's almost never happened before. And the event is sharing so much information about the royal family publicly, leaking that information, giving you a glimpse into the private life of the royals. Okay, and our final paragraph. Harry has said that he still wants a reconciliation with his family. When you have a reconciliation, it's when, so 
Two parties, they're disputing, they're feuding, they're fighting. But if they reconcile, which is the verb to reconcile, is when they come back together as a family. So right now there's Prince Harry here and there's Prince William, Prince Charles or King Charles here. They're divided right? So to bring them back together, that's to reconcile. Reconciliation is just the noun of it, to reconcile. We use this a lot in a legal context because if a husband and wife, they separate, which is a legal event when they no longer want to be married. But then if they reconcile, it means they do want to be married again and they do not end their marriage. That's reconcile. So to become friendly again after a dispute, to reconcile. So he wants to reconcile. He wants a reconciliation with his family and believes one is possible, but asked whether he had burned his bridges with his father and brother. To burn one's bridge is an idiom. So imagine right now if I'm here and I want to get there, and there's a bridge, I can easily go back and forth between the two, right? But if I burn the bridge, the bridge is no longer there. I can't get there, right? So it's when you act in a way that makes reconciliation impossible, or act in a way that it's impossible to get to something else. So a lot of people are advised when you quit your job, don't burn your bridges because you want to be able to go back to that job in the future. How could you burn your bridges? Well, if you tell your boss, you were the worst employer I ever had. I hated working for you. You're a jerk. And you do something that makes it so your employer would never want to work with you again. So that bridge to that job is gone, right? So here I've added the definition and the example. Don't burn your bridges when you quit. So be very polite, friendly, because you may need a reference from your company or you may want to go back to that company in the future. So that's the article. I'm sure there's a lot more interesting details about this new memoir, Spare. Are you going to read it? Share it in the comments if you plan on reading this memoir. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the article from start to finish in full so you can practice along with my pronunciation. Let's do that now. Prince Harry's memoir, Spare, which captures the ugly side of royal life, hits bookshelves. Prince Harry's memoir was released Tuesday, not only offering new details on the British royal family's bitter internal feud after days of bombshell revelations and promotional interviews, but also describing how he fell headlong in love with his future wife, Meghan Markle. While many of the details from the book, titled Spare, have already been reported, its release at midnight Monday local time will allow the public to get their hands on a copy of a memoir filled with glimpses into a rarefied family riven by disagreement and distrust. Some Britons flock to bookshops overnight to be among the first to buy a copy of Spare. Some of the book's most eye-catching passages include allegations that Harry's brother and heir to the throne, Prince William, physically attacked him during a dispute, that his stepmother, Camilla, the queen consort, leaked private conversations to bolster her reputation, and that his father, King Charles III, had pleaded with his sons to not make his final years a misery with their arguing. The publication of such a frank and revealing account is a near unprecedented event in the centuries-old history of Britain's royals, who, as Harry has pointed out, double as both a family and national institution. 
The book has led to questions over whether it could deal lasting damage to the monarchy, even asking whether its future existence is now less certain. Harry has said that he still wants a reconciliation with his family and believes one is possible, but asked whether he had burned his bridges with his father and brother. Amazing job with that article. Now feel free to hit pause, take a break, go get a cup of coffee or tea, review the vocabulary you just learned, and when you're ready, hit play and we'll continue on with the next article. We're talking about one of the most popular stores around the world, Walmart. Do you shop at Walmart? I'm sure it's very popular in your city, right? If it is, let us know in the comments. And we're talking specifically about bags. So let's read the headline. Walmart bans single-use bags in more stores. First, let's talk about the word ban. This is a verb. Right now it's conjugated in the present simple and is conjugated with Walmart, which is it. Walmart, the subject is it. So it bans single use bags in more stores. So to ban. When you ban something, you no longer allow it. So to no longer allow it to no longer allow something. We can even use this with someone. <laughs> For example, you might say, she was banned from Walmart because she stole something. So she took an item without paying for it. That means to steal. This is the past simple, stole. So she stole something, which is illegal, obviously. So she is no longer allowed at Walmart. She's banned from Walmart. Now, we use this with things like bags. You can use it with certain products like smoking. Smoking is banned in almost all public places, at least in North America. So smoking has been banned from all restaurants, I'll say. All restaurants, in North America at least. Is it the same in your country? Can you smoke in a restaurant? You certainly cannot in North America. Notice I put the present perfect. Smoking has been banned. I use the present perfect simply because it's a completed action in the past, but there's a result in the present. The result now is you cannot smoke at a restaurant. That's why I used the present perfect. Now, notice this is also in the passive form, I should point out, to be banned because she is receiving the action. She isn't doing the action, right? So if I wanted to put it in the active form, what would I do to this sentence? To put this sentence in the active form, I would start with Walmart, which is the subject doing the action, Walmart banned her from its stores, Walmart stores, because she stole <laughs> something. Walmart banned her from its stores because she stole something. Now, in this case, I would say restaurants have banned smoking to put it in the active form. So this is a common one to put in the passive form because it's focusing on the result of the action, not who is doing the action. So that could be a good one to practice in the active and the passive, and you can do that in the comment section if you'd like. Now, single use bag. This <laughs> is a single use bag. You use it once, and then you throw it away. That's where the single use came from. On the other hand, this is a reusable bag. And of course, they're right here in the picture as well. Let's continue on. 
Walmart will eliminate our future simple. So this hasn't happened yet because it's in the future simple, which is, of course, will plus base verb. That's our future simple. Will eliminate single use paper and plastic. So the example I gave was just plastic, but you can also have single use paper, a paper bag, and then you throw it out after one use. Carry out bags. A carry out bag is just a bag that you use to carry out your items. So instead of carrying them in your hands, you obviously put your items in your bag and you use the bag to carry out the items. So that's just what they mean by a carry out bag. At the register, so this is the register where you pay. This looks like a self checkout and there is a scanner and you can put your payment details. So this is a register, what you see in the picture right here. At the register from stores in New York, Connecticut, and Colorado this month. So specific stores. Let's continue on. Walmart offers reusable shopping bags starting at 74 cents for customers without their own bags. So Walmart will no longer provide you with a bag. You have to pay for a bag. So you either bring your own bag to the store or you purchase one of their bags for 74 cents, which is less than a dollar. Now notice it says starting at, which means that 74 cents is the minimum price. There may be bags that are more expensive. So maybe 74 cents is for a small bag. And then there are larger bags that are $1.25, for example. We see this starting at plus price. So starting at plus price to say that the price is the minimum price. So we see this a lot in real estate. It might say these new condos start at 300,000. These new condos start at 300,000, which means the smallest unit, the cheapest unit is 300,000 and there are more expensive units available. So start at plus a price, minimum price. All right. And notice our verb tense here offers. What verb tense is this? Walmart offers. It is the present simple, right? Present simple. And in this case, we're using the present simple because it's just a fact. Walmart offers. It's a fact. Walmart offers reusable shopping bags. Again, this is a reusable shopping bag. So what about you? Do you currently use reusable shopping bags? When you go to the store, do you take your own reusable shopping bags? Hmm. Share that in the comments if you'd like. Let's continue on. Walmart's policies will mean the company is ahead of lawmakers in these states in the growing push to eliminate bags that are typically used once and then discarded. All right. So here, the company is ahead of lawmakers. This implies that a lawmaker, of course, is someone who makes a law. So this will likely be some sort of government law. So they are creating the law and soon legally we will not be able to use plastic bags. They're going to ban them. So Walmart knows that's going to happen and they're doing it on their own before the official law. So before they're officially legally required by the government, Walmart is doing this. So that means they're ahead of the law. Now also let's look at this in the growing push. Growing in this context means increasing, in, oops, increasing. Now a push to do something is when Walmart 
is feeling pressure to do this, probably because of environmental groups, because of climate change, because of consumer preferences and behavior, because of government policies that are going to come out in the near future. So there's a lot of pressure from other people to do something. And that pressure is increasing with growing. So push to, you can think of that just as pressure to, which means many people want something to happen. So within a business context, you might say within our company, there's a growing push to work in the office. So right now, most people are working remotely, right? At home. But there's a growing, which means increasing push to. So pressure from HR department, from your boss, from managers, from clients, from stakeholders. They're saying, we want you back in the office. There's a growing push to work in the office. Let's continue on. Oh, I'll just point out discarded is another way of saying thrown out, thrown out, and then discarded, thrown out, which means put in the garbage. So put in the garbage. So thrown is the third form of the verb. The verb is irregular. It's throw through and then thrown, throw out, I threw out my plastic bag, I've already thrown out all my plastic bags, I've put them in the garbage. Discarded is a more formal way of saying it, honestly, for your purposes in an everyday context, use throw out, it's way more common. Let's continue on. Plastic bags entered supermarkets and retail chains during the 1970s and 1980s. Before then, so before then, prior to 1970, so that would mean in 1965, for example. Before then, customers used paper bags to bring groceries and other merchandise back home from the stores. Retailers switched to plastic bags because they were cheaper. Hmm. So switch to something. So that is when, I wish I didn't throw out my bag. That's when you have your single use bag, which is a plastic bag, and then you switch and you start using something else. So my reusable bag. We use this a lot. You might say, I think I might, I think I might switch to Apple, which means right now you are not using Apple products. Maybe you're using Samsung or something else. And then you're going to start using Apple switch to, if you want to include what you're currently using, you would say, I think I might switch from Android to Apple. So we use this with technology. You might switch the type of shampoo you use because you're not satisfied with it. You might switch what road you take to work because you want one with less traffic. So you can use this in many, many different ways. Just remember, switch to is the something you're going to start using. And switch from is the something you're going to stop using. Let's continue on. Americans use roughly 100 billion plastic bags every year. Wow, that sounds like a lot of plastic bags. Roughly means approximately. So it could be 90 billion. It could be 110 billion. It's approximately. 
approximately. Another way is around, around 100 billion. So around is probably the most casual. It's not slang in any way, but probably the most casual. Roughly would be in the middle and then approximately would pr be the most formal. For example, you could say, I used roughly 10 plastic bags last month. Now you could say, I used approximately 10 plastic bags last month or around 10 plastic bags. Same thing. Just a slight difference in the level of formality. Let's continue on. Plastic bags are also a major source of litter and wind up in the ocean, rivers, and sewers and harm wildlife. Let's look at wind up. This is a very useful phrasal verb. So I have my verb to wind and then my preposition wind up. Now, wind up, this is used to mean when you're in a particular situation or condition, but it's usually to be in... I'll say an unexpected particular situation or condition. So this, the ocean, the rivers, sewers, that is not where these bags are supposed to be. They're supposed to be in the recycling bin, the recycling plant. But if they wind up here, it means they are in that situation or condition in the ocean and it's unexpected or unintended. That could be another one, unintended that they're there. So I might say, I stayed at home last night but if I added I winded up I have to change this to a gerund because I have my preposition up so I have to use a gerund grammatically now if I added I winded up staying at home last night this implies to you that it was unexpected or unintended so maybe I wanted to go to a party or I wanted to go to the mall but for some reason I didn't and I winded up staying at home. So that's all it does. It just talks about the, the end condition or situation or location, but implies that it was unexpected or unintended. So I'll write the original sentence. I stayed at home last night because if I just say this, you have no idea if I wanted to or if I didn't want to. But if I add wind it up, then you understand that wasn't my original intention. Just like the intention for these bags is not to be in the ocean. So let's continue on. Plastic bags do not biodegrade and only 10% of them are ever recycled. Biodegrade is what happens when it is recycled. So when it biodegrades, it goes back into a, a different material that can be recycled, reused, but plastic does not do that. Paper bags, on the other hand, this is a great expression to show contrast because here we're talking about plastic bags. Now I want to switch to paper bags so I can use on the other hand. Paper bags, on the other hand, are more easily recycled than plastic bags and are biodegradable. So paper bags do break down into particles that can be recycled, reused. But some states and cities have moved to ban, so to not allow paper bags because they are carbon intensive to produce. Adding carbon intensive, this means they take a lot of carbon. So they require a lot of carbon. Require a lot of carbon. We use this quite a lot, to be honest. 
I could say this job is very labor intensive, which means labor in this case means I'm like using my physical strength. This job is very labor intensive. I have to lift a lot of heavy objects and heavy boxes and I'm very exhausted at the end of the day, labor intensive. We use this with time intensive. This task is very time intensive. So maybe it's not a difficult task, but it takes a lot of time. So when you add intensive to the noun, it simply means require a lot of, and then whatever that noun is. So that's our article. I hope you learned a lot of great vocabulary and grammar, and hopefully now you will start using reusable bags if you don't already. So now what I'll do is I'll read the article from start to finish so you can focus on my pronunciation and practice along with my pronunciation. So let's do that now. Walmart bans single-use bags in more stores. Walmart will eliminate single-use paper and plastic carry-out bags at the register from stores in New York, Connecticut, and Colorado this month. Walmart offers reusable shopping bags starting at $0.74 cents for customers without their own bags. Walmart's policies will mean the company is ahead of lawmakers in these states in the growing push to eliminate bags that are typically used once and then discarded. Plastic bags entered supermarkets and retail chains during the 1970s and 1980s. Before then, customers used paper bags to bring groceries and other merchandise back home from stores. Retailers switched to plastic bags because they were cheaper. Americans use roughly 100 billion plastic bags every year. Plastic bags are also a major source of litter and wind up in the ocean, rivers, and sewers and harm wildlife. Plastic bags are the fifth most common type of plastic litter, according to Ocean Conservancy, an environmental advocacy group. Plastic bags do not biodegrade, and only 10% of them are ever recycled. Paper bags, on the other hand, are more easily recycled than plastic bags and are biodegradable. But some states and cities have moved to ban them because they are carbon intensive to produce. Amazing job with that article. Now feel free to hit pause, take a break, go get a cup of coffee or tea, review the vocabulary you just learned, and when you're ready, hit play and we'll continue on with the next article. As you can see by this beautiful picture, we're talking about biodiversity. So first, let me read the article in full so you have a general idea of the context and you can pay attention to my pronunciation as well. And then I will explain some key vocabulary and grammar points. So I'll read the article in full now. Biodiversity. Can we set aside a third of our planet for nature? It's being called a last chance for nature. 100 countries backing calls to protect 30% of the planet. The aim is to reach this goal by 2030 and conserve forests and other vital ecosystems in order to restore the natural world. The 30 by 30 target is the key ambition of the UN Biodiversity Summit, COP15. But as the talks in Montreal, Canada move into their final days, there is division over this and many other targets. Scientists have warned that with forests and grasslands being lost at unprecedented rates and oceans under pressure from pollution and overfishing, humans are pushing the earth beyond safe limits. This includes increasing the risk of diseases like SARS, COVID-2, Ebola, and HIV. 
spilling over from wild animals into human populations. Under the proposed agreement, countries would sign up to targets to expand protected areas, such as nature reserves. It draws inspiration from the so-called father of biodiversity, the biologist Edward O. Wilson, who called for half of Earth to be protected. But there is debate over how much land and sea to include, and some scientists fear the targets may be diluted. So now let's talk about some of the key vocabulary and grammar concepts. If there's a specific word you don't understand or grammar concept, feel free to leave it in the comment section and I'll do my best to answer it. So let's start right at the title here, biodiversity. Can we set aside a third of our planet for nature? Excellent question. I certainly hope we can. Let's take a look at this, to set aside. This is a phrasal verb, so I have my verb, which is set, and my preposition aside. To set something aside. Now you set something aside, in this case the something is a third of our planet for nature. When you set something aside, it means you reserve it. And generally, we reserve whatever that it is for a future use. So in the context of our planet, we're saying take 30% of it and reserve it. And we're going to reserve it for a specific purpose and that, in this case, it's nature. So we're not going to use it for any other purpose. We use this a lot in a business context, for example, can you set aside a few minutes to discuss the project? So you could ask your boss this, your client this, a coworker this. In this case, we're talking about setting aside time because you have a set amount of time, eight hours in your workday, right? And you're going to reserve an amount of time, in this case, just a few minutes for a specific purpose. And in this case, that specific purpose is to discuss the project. So for now, get comfortable using this with time, but you can absolutely practice with other some things as well. Now I do want to point out, this is a question and I know this because for one, I'm starting with my modal verb can, which is a question word, and I also have a question mark. Now for pronunciation, if you go back to when I read the article, you may have noticed something called inflection when my voice raised at the end. We do that for yes or no questions. So I'm going to read this again and notice how my inflection rises so my voice is high at the very end of this word because it's a question. Can we set aside a third of our planet for nature? Nature. Remember, we do that for yes or no questions. So inflection for yes, no questions. Let's continue on. It's being called a last chance for nature. 100 countries backing calls to protect 30% of the planet. Okay, what does it mean to back calls? Are we talking about a telephone call? In this case, the call is to do something specific. You can call on someone to do something. For example, I call on the government to protect the environment. I'm not calling the government. I'm calling on the government. I'm requesting that they do something specific. Now, when I back a call, the verb to back, it means to support. So it's saying that 100 countries support protecting 30% of the planet. And remember, this call represents the request. Request to do something. That's the call in this case. And back means to support. Support. So let's think of an example. What could I say? 
the client wants us to back their price increase. Notice how I put the client singular, but then I put my possessive as a plural, their price increase. Native speakers do this because the client could be male or female. And when we don't want to be gender specific, we use there. This isn't official in the dictionary. It's a force of habit. The correct way, according to the dictionary, would be the client wants us to back his price increase, her price increase, or if you want to be gender neutral, you would have to say his or her price increase because there is no singular that represents both genders. So native speakers will frequently say their because it's just easier than saying his or her. Just keep that in mind though, because for your IELTS exam, this is not currently a grammar rule is just something that we do. The client wants us to back his price increase. In this case, back, remember, it means support, support. You probably know this, or it might make sense to you when you think of the expression, the idiom in English, I got your back, I have your back. If you say that to someone, it means I support you. Don't worry, I have or I got your back. We use it with both the verb have or the verb got. Both of them are very common. I have your back, I got your back, and that means I support you. So that is where this comes from, perhaps. But now you learn this expression as well. So let's continue on. The aim, aim is another way of saying goal. So if you want an alternative added to your vocabulary that sounds very formal and advanced, you can use aim. The aim of my project is to, instead of the goal. The aim of the proposal, the aim is to reach this goal by 2030 and conserve forests and other vital ecosystems in order to restore the natural world. Vital is a great word to add to your vocabulary. It means necessary, necessary ecosystems and other vital. When something is vital, you cannot have an option without it. It has to be there. It's necessary and other vital ecosystems. So for our planet, we can't not have fish in the sea. That would create widespread disaster across the world, right? So fish in the sea are vital. They're necessary. And an ecosystem is just one element of the world, one element natural element of the world. I'll teach you an advanced sentence structure that you can use with the word vital because we commonly say it's vital that I talk to the client today. So it's saying it's necessary, but vital sounds very strong. It sounds like if I don't talk to the client today, something bad will happen. It's vital. So it's very strong. It's almost a little dramatic. It will definitely get someone's attention. If somebody says, it's vital that I talk to you today, I would want to know what that person wants to tell me because it sounds very important. Sometimes, even though this is already quite strong, we make this even stronger by saying it's absolutely vital that I talk to you today or the client today. This is to make it even stronger. But keep in mind, you don't need this because it's already very strong, but you can include it. 
So you might say <laughs> it's vital that I become a fluent and confident. I always like to add confident because I know a lot of students who are fluent, but they're not confident. So I always like to include both of those. It's vital that I become a fluent and confident English speaker. Now, it might be vital because you won't get the job without it, right? Or you won't be able to get a promotion without it. So this is a very nice sentence structure. And notice the sentence structure. To be vital, it is vital that, okay, that... And then you have a clause. A clause is simply a sentence. We have a subject, a verb, and an object. So to be vital, that, and then your clause. Practice that in the comments below. Let's continue on. The 30 by 30 target. This 30 by 30, well, think back. It was right here, 30%, right? by 2030. So it's just a clever way of saying 30% by 2030, 30 by 30 target is the key ambition of the UN Biodiversity Summit COP15. You've probably heard about COP15. It's been in the news a lot recently. But as the talks in Montreal, Canada, woohoo, Montreal. I live two hours from Montreal, by the way. But as the talks in Montreal, Canada move into their final days, there is division over this and many other targets. If there's division, division means separation, right? So it means some countries want this, some countries want this. There's division. I guess another way of saying it might be disagreement, disagreement. Disagreement. That's a good one. And notice our preposition. When you're learning a new word, it's useful to understand how it's used in a complete sentence. You need the preposition over. Division over something. And we would use over with disagreement as well. Disagreement over something. And the something being this. So the this, I guess, is the 30 by 30 target and many other targets. Scientists have warned that with forests and grasslands being lost at unprecedented rates and oceans under pressure from pollution and overfishing. Okay, let's just stop there because it's quite a long sentence. Unprecedented, unprecedented, unprecedented. When something is unprecedented, it means it's never happened before. It's never happened before. So this is the first time it's happening. The fact that forests and grasslands are disappearing, I'm just going to say 10% per year. No idea if that's correct. That has never happened before. It's unprecedented. Unprecedented rates and oceans under pressure from pollution and overfishing. Over added to the verb fishing. Overfishing means fishing too much. Fishing too much. Fishing too much. Overfishing. Humans are pushing the earth beyond safe limits. When you push something beyond a limit, so this is the limit and earth is right here behind the limit. And the limit is you can't go beyond this, okay? But when you push it, it means you're going more than what is wanted or needed or required. So we use this a lot when we're doing tasks. I might say this, what task? This accounting problem is pushing us beyond our limits. And in this case, what could your limits be? Well, it could be your knowledge. So your knowledge of accounting is here, 
but this project requires your knowledge to be here greater than what it currently is. So it could be your knowledge. It could be your time, your resources, many other things that could represent that limit. So that's a good expression, pushing beyond the limits there. Let's continue on. This includes, so they're listing how the earth is being pushed beyond its limits, more than wanted, needed, required, necessary. This includes increasing the risk of diseases like SARS, CoV-2, I don't know what this is, CoV-2, Ebola, and HIV. Spilling over from wild animals into human populations. When something spills over, it, it's another way of saying transfers. So let's, let's say this problem is in the accounting department, which is here. But then I have the marketing department here. The problem should stay in the accounting department, but it might spill over into the marketing department, which means it, it transfers into the marketing department. So now that problem is in two places. So we do use this for, for general problems. So you might actually, a good example I just thought of was my work is spilling over into my personal life. So your work should be here at work, but it's spilling over, it's transferring to, it's affecting. So I guess that's an easy way to think of it. When, when a problem or issue in one area starts affecting another area. So one area in this case is work, and the other area is your personal life. That happens a lot, right? It could be a conflict, a conflict where someone is spilling over into another relationship, for example. So that's, that's a good expression. Practice that one in the comments as well. It's more of an advanced sentence structure. And notice this double preposition, over, but then if you want to specify the the part that's receiving the problem you have to use into is spilling over. And then this into belongs to the area that's receiving it. So notice that for, for forming the sentence correctly. Let's continue on. Under the proposed agreement, proposed means that this has not been officially signed. So it's just proposed. It's not official. So something that has been suggested or recommended, but not official yet. Yet meaning that it can be official in the future, but it's also possible that it won't be official. Under the proposed agreement, countries would sign up to targets to expand protected areas such as nature reserves. It draws inspiration from the so-called father of biodiversity, the biologist Edward O. Wilson, who called for half of earth to be protected. So here we're seeing this again. He's not calling. He's not making a call. He's requesting something specific happen. So I don't know if I wrote the definition before, so I will now to call for something to request something specific to happen. For example, the activists called for laws to protect the environment. They requested let's continue. But there is debate over how much land and sea to include, and some scientists fear the targets may be diluted. Notice our preposition here, debate over. There's debate over something. 
I'm sure you know what debate means is when one person wants this, one person thinks that, and there is not agreement. But I just want you to notice the preposition here, debate over something. Now, diluted, in this case, is acting as an adjective because I have my verb be, be diluted. When you dilute something, you make it less strong. This is actually commonly used in cooking. So let's say I have this small glass of water, right? But let's say this is entirely lemon juice. That would be very strong. If I took a sip of that, it would be very strong. So if I want to dilute it, I need to make this less strong. How do I do that? Well, obviously, I can pour water in, and when I add water to this lemon juice, it will dilute the lemon juice. It will make it less strong. So we commonly use this with liquids. Let's say you got a cup of coffee and it was just very strong. The taste was so strong. You might dilute it by adding some water. You could do that. You might add some milk as well to make it less strong, but we commonly use it by adding water. Now, in this case, they're talking about the target. So the targets may be diluted, which means less strong, right? Less strong, commonly used with cooking or beverages. I'm just going to write my example for you now. That lemon juice is too strong, can... I have some water so I can dilute it. So I can dilute it. In this case, it's being used as the active verb to dilute something. In this case, it's being used as an ag adjective to be diluted, to be diluted. And this is our adjective, diluted. Now, our targets. The targets may be diluted. So what are the targets that they're proposing? It was 30, right? 30%, 30 by 30, 30%. So if it's diluted, what would the target be? Well, it would be anything less than 30, right? It, that's how it would be less strong. So it might be 25%, 24%, 22%. Hopefully nothing like 10% or 5% because if it were 5% or 10%, it would be severely diluted. I would say that. This is just, you know, a little diluted. This is severely diluted. So that's how you would dilute a target. You would make it less strong. And remember, we commonly use this with beverages. So that's the end of our article. I hope you enjoyed it and enjoyed all the vocabulary and grammar. And the topic is very interesting, isn't it? I wonder if your country is going to participate and reserve 30% of your country just for natural environment. Do you think that's a good idea? Share your thoughts in the comments below and I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Amazing job with this lesson now. What was your favorite new word from this lesson? Leave that in the comments below and leave an example sentence practicing your new vocabulary. And if you found this lesson helpful, please hit the like button, share it with your friends, and of course, subscribe. And before you go, make sure you head to my website and get your free speaking guide. In this guide, I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. And until next time, happy studying.